date is December 7th, 1941, the beginning of World War II. At this point, we heard this information on the radio. There wasn't any other way. Immediate communication. So we had this opportunity to hear what was going on, stick to the radio, and, and, and listen, using our ears, not our eyes. But the paper came out the next day. A lot of people think of the beginning of the war as just being, being Pearl Harbor. It wasn't the Japanese covering the whole Pacific. And they bombed Hawaii, Philippines, invaded Thailand, Malaysia, two U.S. battleships <coughs> sunk at Pearl Harbor. Okay. But it was a lot different. of the service they were going into, or the draft would get you. <laughs> and so, <coughs> but if you were in college, you got a deferment for a while anyway. And when, when there was one year to go to college, we uh, had an opportunity to sign up for various uh, service uh, organizations. Navy had V-70. Which is the one that I went for. And that, if you had one year of college, you, uh, you join the Navy, whatever time that would be, that would exclude you from the draft in any case. And, uh, and, that, and, and you also had to take certain courses in college, and you had to have certain majors. officers knew that they were going to invade Northern Europe. I figured they would lose a lot of junior officers in the Army, and unfortunately that's what happened. Is the junior officers were, were popped off first. <laughs> and so they needed more. Didn't have, Annapolis wasn't going to handle it. So Columbia was one of those. Northwestern <coughs> was another. And Notre Dame was another. And they established uh, little Annapolis and uh, same time, this wasn't just the men who were deciding what they were going to do. The women took over some all sorts of jobs that the men might have been doing before, maybe working a cabin or something else. And uh, they, uh, they then filled in for the men that were going into the service. CVP, landing craft vehicle personnel. It handled 36 men and had metal on each side, 
also called a Higgins boat. Higgins was one who developed it. And uh, it had a, at the front, there was a metal uh, ramp that dropped down so that they could get out in a hurry. Before this one, there was a very narrow uh, LCP. circles. That was for mounting a machine gun. They had two machine guns in the back, thirty towers, and they had those mounted there. But when during the invasions that I was in, they took them off because prior to that in Sicily they found out that there was was more friendly fire from these machine guns. shoot our guys down there and he's doing a good enough job of it. So that's what happened on the next this is the LCM. The LCM was fifty foot long. It had two gray marine diesel engines and two screws so you could maneuver this in any place and turn on a dime. LCA. This is a British landing craft. Unfortunately, it wasn't very practical. This is what they had. And the Lions and the Tigers <coughs> kept soldiers in hang on to them. But uh, and there was just a narrow ramp in front. It didn't handle it. It was in rough seas very <coughs> This is the ship I spent the whole war on after I got into action service. Now, we had three inch guns, 40 millimeter, 20 millimeter, and we carried the landing craft on the deck. And those big posts going up, the booms would go out from those and pick up one of these landing craft and put it in the water. We went to, to New York to meet from the Little Creek, Virginia, for some primary training. And, and we got our men there and some dozens of junior officers to uh, figure out what these men would be best suited for on the boats. And uh, then we would, <coughs> and they went to, we got to, uh, <laughs> in any case, here we are in the North Atlantic. here, you don't go in a straight line anyway. So we follow what was called the Great Circle Route. Because, as you may have heard, the world is round. And we go on the Circle Route, which is the, the quickest route past the route between the places. So we left from New York. We were going over here. And Great Britain, Bristol Channel. Harbor. And 
handed out the next day. They were just waiting for us to get a board. And the next day we headed out for Cardiff, past the light ship and out of the harbor. And uh, as we left, we had 1,800 soldiers on board. This was not the most of the carry. After that, one night I was the uh, I was the officer of the deck. And I went up to the bridge. And I was standing on the bridge. It's Admiral. I had never seen him before. <laughs> and he was standing there braced like this, so going from side to side. And I spoke to him and I said, "How are things going, Admiral?" He said, not well tonight. He said, we have a couple of problems. One, the ship is rolling further than it should. <clears throat> the there's a inclinometer mounted on the wall in front of the bridge. It tells you how far you're rolling. He said, we've gone 27 degrees twice tonight. That's more than the ship's supposed to be. He says, it should just keep on going. <laughs> in any case, and he said, we also know that there are, are there's more than one German wolf pack of submarines out there that's been shattering us or uh, approaching our whole trip. And he said, that is a blessing that we have weather like this. I didn't know this the Admiral, of course he didn't. He was an Admiral carrying it on our ship. We didn't and had an admiral on board, but he was in charge of the convoy. Our convoy comprised 32 ships and we had a destroyer and several destroyers. We had a Ferguson and Sunday and sundry other ships also. And he said the problem with book back fire, submarines fire, torpedoes, torpedoes weather like this are apt to come out of the water hit another uh, wave and it turn around and come right back and what the suffering <laughs> so they don't fire when the weather's this bad so that was good it'd be good but better anyway so then we headed out and continued around the northern end of Ireland we couldn't go around the southern end distance. We went around the northern end of Ireland and uh, into the Bristol Channel. The Bristol Channel is an interesting place because the tides were very high there, 30 feet as I remember. And uh, so as we went into the channel, the sea uh, on the side. Fishing boats all lying on their side. So, little bays as we went in. And uh, so that was, that was that side. And we got in. And you couldn't go into uh, Bristol because uh, you had to use locks to go in in any case. And so we went in with, uh, we didn't go into the Bristol stayed in the harbor, I loaded some of our LCBPs, and got our, our soldiers off, those 1,800 soldiers, and took them over to Cardiff, Wales, very interesting place, Welsh languages, more than you can. Look at what we could handle. And we were fast enough, so equipment being unloaded. Streets and some pictures I found secure airplanes going through the streets. They're unloaded from ships. And so that was one of the examples. Well, after we got through with the, the unloading the ships, then we went up to. 
went ahead. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> the first time who are going to be involved in the actual landing to about the middle of the night to be on our landing craft and go over to a dance hall that was on, the, on a pier. We were over there and we got onto the ladders going up. The ladders were there by the way. And, and so we climbed up those ladders and into the dance hall. And there we received all the information on the invasion. This was top secret. So we also got all sorts of other information. For instance, that it was anticipated that Germans had a lot of gas that goes to the First World War, as a matter of fact. And so it was believed that since this was the toughest thing they could uh, expect to hit, because this was their salvation.
perception of there Europe, in Spain, and they had a wall built, maybe around this, back up Denmark, and skipped over here, up to Norway, a place where Norway joins Russia. They had that wall built, all sorts of here, which how major those things were. <coughs> Same location, at that same meeting, the dance hall. Even charts like this, which showed where we were going to go. I went in here, you can see back here. element C that's ten and a half feet high. And you can see it has braces, so if you drop your ramp against that, all you can do is drive it into the sand at the back. It's not going to do anything else. It's not going to replace the horses. Anyway, that's basically what we learned about that time. We got back to our ship and after this briefing, and two, two, year, two hours later, we were hit by German dive bombers. We come back on the tail end of one of our raids. We saw the, our planes that went over Point the Hawk. And, uh, you know, and these planes would come back to Britain. No one knew how many there were. Be, unfortunately. And so the Germans got onto that, so all they did was just follow their planes directly on the tail end of ours returning. And so they were dropping bombs on our, on our place where all of our ships were. One landed right off the port side of our ship and uh, caused sufficient damage so that it sprung the 
bearings on our main shaft, which drives the ship, and, and, and uh, it also caused a lot of interior damage, but that was just things that were broken out with the batter. So it was a... <coughs> Now we're going to go into the beach. Uh, on the beach, we found about halfway in, and we saw all sorts of huge ships in line battleships, cruisers, destroyers sitting off to one side, just sitting there. We thought they were going to do something later on. And they, uh, their duty was to go up this line. That Shower, which was at 6 30 in the morning. We, we left at 4 o'clock uh, from our ship. And, and we had, I had on my tour, what as I say, I was on the there's, there's a view of the Omaha Beach. You see all the little farms. A lot of little farms. A lot of these people live in the town. Six men, our boat did 36 men there, and the cabin. And on this, I, on the way in, I asked him, I said, what, What's your mission? He said, Our mission is these are men I have, our combat engineers, and our duty is to. Any obstacle went on the beach. And uh, they had bandoliers and plastic bound them up the red around their waist. All they do is get a hump of this plastic sticker on it and on the obstacle and put a fuse in it and it up. By the way, this was all happening now on the 6th.
that night before the invasion, and an army had uh, officer on board, uh, an observer, and uh, all the officers who were involved in the invasion uh, did their, uh, were called up to the war room once we got He told us what the, our Air Force was going to do in general. And uh, so they would be bombing the whole northern coast of France starting at midnight and at 2 to 4 a.m. they would bomb or beach or the entire beach area and then starting at uh, 6 a.m. they would bomb specific beaches where the landings would be. The ships that I mentioned were out there, the battleships and destroyers, this is what they did to those wall. of demarcation, which was 2,000 yards out from the beach. It's a control officers on it. We instruct the boats as to what they should do at that point. And we did not have radios on our boats. And there was one of the men who came out, and the officers came out, and said, get into the beach as fast as you can. I said, we're supposed to get our weight together at this point. not going well on the beach and you get in there. So obviously you count the bed with what we had and the head of the room so we had it to the beach and, and uh then we got in. The Germans could fire at us at all so we got about 30, 40 yards off the beach and then they could start hitting us with 88s and those 88s fire like boom. Boom. Fortunately for us, we were firing anti-personnel shells. They were just getting the soldiers coming in. And they didn't have any effect on ours, and uh, not much effect, I don't think. Afterwards, we had shrapnel all over the deck of our, of our boat. They, so they were up to their <coughs> We went in, we could see what was ahead of us. See that none of the obstacles were drawn, so our objective was to get as far in as we could. We did, but unfortunately, we couldn't get beyond these so called yellow seas, and so what we had to do was drop our ramp, and just before we dropped our ramp, we had to set up a crossfire on our bow with what I was trying to do with the caliber of machine guns. And so that's a tough thing.
that point, headed back to Chile. Got there, we picked up another uh, load of uh, soldiers and headed in once again. This time, we went in further over the left, way over the left, approached the beach. We could see that there were soldiers, German soldiers, that had been captured. Bodies spread all over the beach. And as we went in, we recognized this is probably three hours at least since the first invasion of that area. By the time we get back down to the ship and back in, we probably had three to four hours. And so this was, you know, I told you, I'm not going to see if you can't land someplace where you don't have bodies. Went back there and uh, we didn't go back there. He said, we denied. He said, uh, the reason is that we had to close off that part of the beach and get as many people off and shove them down. Because he said the Germans had to put control of that, that motion. So they did. And then after that, now that they were saw next to us, People want to stick around for a few minutes? I, mean, I, I, I can finish this part of it in a, in a minute. Germans did not use gas. Actually, there was peace. <laughs> <laughs> 